Welcome to the Chess Channel, the channel where you can learn loads. Firstly, I would like to apologize for not being able to cover the games I would have wanted to cover, but I guess better than later than never. Today we have a true classic. It is between two of the best chess players the world has ever seen. One is Bobby Fischer and the other Mikhail Tal. The critical question everybody asks is whether one player was better and stronger than the other. There is no easy answer here. By the time Bobby Fischer became the player he was, Tal was on his way out. He took a different path and as a result did not live to get as old as other people do. Both had their own fans. If you asked a Fischer fan, they would say Fischer was a better player. And if you asked Tal's fans, you know what you will get to hear. If you look at the results against each other, you may come to the conclusion that whatever games Fischer and Tal played, they had ended with exactly the same score. Let us go and look at one game between the two that dates back to 1959, a date probably many of us were not even born. The game was played in Yugoslavia during the candidates and took place in Bled, Zagreb and Belgrade. We know this game between the two legends was played in Belgrade because Fischer himself made mention of this in his very book. Fischer starting from this side went for 1e4 and Tal uses the Sicilian as a result. Knight f3 led to this move, Fischer here goes for the center, and with these two pawns coming off Tal develops the knight and launches after this central pawn. Knight c3 to protect the pawn resulted to this move by Tal, and for those who know their openings, isn't this one of the most popular ways to respond? This variation moved into a more refined line. If you love your openings and you are interested in knowing what opening we are looking at, so far we saw the open Sicilian leading towards the flank, or Sozin. When we get to see b5, then this would be the opening we just talked about. Fischer loved his bishops on c4, and having gone for this move in this particular game, Tal knew exactly how to find a way to try and neutralize this bishop. This was the move he initiated. Fischer knew his bishop could easily get attached. The bishop was retreated to this outpost. Tal in turn launches this attack, and at some stage, he would want to get the bishop on c8 to find the diagonal. Fischer was a truly charismatic player, but you also need to consider his age back in 1959. He was up against a much more matured player, but was age the problem, or did other factors come into play? Fischer in this point in time opted for this push on the other side of the board, and though bishop b7 could have been expected, Tal bypasses this response, and chooses to attack the knight on c3. So what you are about to witness is that once this knight makes his way out of c3, this pawn in the center would become unprotected, and Tal is most likely to scoop him up. So right after the knight sought safety into the rim of the chessboard, Tal was about to take no prisoners. He first removed this pawn from the center of the chessboard. Fischer here finds the opportune moment to get his king to safety. And here is where the party is going to really start. Tal has knight f6, bishop e7, and of course bishop b7. What did he go for? None of the above. This was the move he initiated, and fully knows should the knight on e4 come under scrutiny, he would have no trouble getting him to safety or he can summon at least a pawn to protect him, and that is if bishop b7 is not preferred. It was however Fischer who came up with a rather surprising and rather unorthodox gesture. This is the move he went for. The question to address is whether to take and how. Tal used this pawn to get the job done, and Fischer in turn is actually the one who comes up with all the surprising moves. Any idea what he tried here? This is what he decided to do, and what a great way to offer the knight. If you want to ask yourself a valid question, is to ask whether this offer was a credible one, or was it simply a blunder? Let's find out. With the knight coming off, can you work out the implications of this response? It's actually not that hard. The idea is that once the queen finds her spot on this square in the center of the board, Fischer would be looking at a mate in one, unless you get the king moving or the bishop. In the meantime, whatever you do, you would need to give up something. First, there is this rook on the queen side that would bite the dust, and this is right after you get confronted by this bishop attack. If you take the rook, after the bishop finds the diagonal, queen b7 and castles, or even before you castle, produce this check, and then right after the king finds the corner, 
Now you can castle. If you do the maths, Fisher would be in a far better position and Tal against his best judgement would be playing catch up. We do need to return to the move because we saw a twist to this variation. Tal could easily work out the ramifications of this variation and in this light decided not to engage. What did he do? He opted for this rook repositioning and trust Bobby Fisher to come up with the move of the day. Can you try and work it out before we show? This was the move we are looking to analyze, and this is exactly how Bobby Fischer played it. This is one crazy attack and you could expect it to come from Fischer. Rook a7 getting him out of the bishop's reach and something had to go, but was it a bargain? Fischer without delay removed the knight. This knight on f5 additionally came off. And with Bobby Fischer capturing the pawn with this bishop, this is how Tal responds. It stops any unnecessary checks and preps a type of tactic. We are not going to investigate further because the following moves would talk for themselves. Fisher saw fit to trade the bishops. Fisher here attempts the attack, but with this queen coming to the rescue, Fisher challenges the queen with the queen. Was this a deliberate act or had Fisher missed the knight was standing in? It was actually a top-notch move and let's see why. Tal took his time to think over what he needed to do. He saw no real danger if he would eliminate the knight, and having done this at this stage, Fisher here gets rid of the pawn, and what this attack does in a way guarantees the rook. This rook on e7 is tied up and cannot go anywhere. Should you attack the bishop for example, once you initiate this check it would be lights out. King d8 leads to a follow-up check using the queen, and if you now try and move the king again, can you fill in the gaps? Try this check and once the king is ejected to the 7th, take with a check and the mate is now locked in. King c6 is additionally going to lead to this bishop to come off, and this discovered check by the queen speaks volumes. Once you flash the king right out and into the middle of the board, there is no coming back. Queen f5 check, king d4 and now this brand new check from e1, and when the king finds this spot on the 4th, this is the mate you have been looking for. Coming back by two moves, there is another way to do it too. It's via this rook check. King c4 forced and the mate is achieved in just one move. It's this rook check and that would be the end of the game. So just a quick recap, all this would have happened if the rook on e7 moves out. Tal knew what he was getting himself into. In the end he found a nice way out. He got his queen to challenge the queen via this move. And it is here where Bobby Fischer does the unthinkable. What do you think he did? Well, let's see what he didn't do. He didn't take the rook on e7 because after the queens on f3 depart, if you take the bishop from in front of the king, after rook f1 and rook g7, this game would still be very much playable. Let us come back to see what Fischer did and how Tal responded. This is move 19. Fischer first got rid of the knight. Tal was probably happy with this arrangement because as soon as he produced this check, this bishop on b8 vanished. Fischer went for the jugular. He launched this queen check, the rook was now forced in to block it, and now via this renewed check using the rook, did Tal have enough to hold it all together? Mind you, Tal is up by a full minor piece and down by a single pawn, would you be able to improvise here, and if so, what is best to answer? If you move the king into d8, you will probably never hear the end, should you go on and remove this pawn from the seventh? As soon as the rook is eliminated, this is what you are looking for, and again it would be game over. Tal applied the most logical move in this position. He got the bishop into e7, Fischer in turn grabs hold of the pawn from f7, and as soon as Tal captured the rook, not queen takes rook from e7, but this check instead. For the record, this was another sacrifice from Fischer, but how is he going to get there? King f8, led to the rook to depart, Tal now brings in the queen to challenge the queen and all he wants is to liquidate. Fischer had already worked out what he tried earlier was a fully blown blunder. In this position, he also knew that if the queens depart, he would never get the chance to recover. In this light, this is how he played it. Rook g6 and a simple c3 resulted to this push on the queen side. Fischer now moved in with this check. Tal ejects his king to the seventh. And as soon as this move materialized, Fischer was able to work out quite clearly what he did just fell apart. Queen c4 led to this bishop response. b4 then came off, and as soon as Tal captured using the pawn, this is how Fischer plays it. 
This was vital to ensure the king is not going to get smothered. With the opening on the king's side, Tal was going to liquidate and was going to liquidate fast. He came in with this incoming check. The rook here steps in to intercept the check, and as soon as the queen's departed, Tal rashes the rook in to protect the pawn on b4. King g2 and king f6 resulted to yet another king move. With Tal charging down the board with his king too, we witnessed another king move, and with Tal now delivering this check, Fisher's options are limited. He backed off the king, Tal now charges after the rook, but this did not pose a problem for Fisher. What he did was to summon the king to his rescue. With Fisher probably wanting to squeeze in a check with rook d4, Tal didn't even allow this to happen. He got the bishop to reposition to this outpost, a move that also attacks this pawn on the queen side, leaving very little room for any reaction, but to return the rook to protect the pawn, Tal again came up with this arrangement, and in fact he was waiting for Fischer to react somehow, Fischer did just this, he opted for this rook repositioning, Tal now swings the rook across and into f6, Fischer has nothing else but to repeat, and now via this rook check, Fischer has no choice but to reciprocate this attack, rook f7, led to king d3 and at this stage Fisher would be the happiest kid about should there be a threefold repetition. Highly unlikely if not impossible. Bishop d4 resulted to this advancement to the third and Fisher hoped this pawn would be traded. It wasn't to be though and Fisher must have expected what was to unfold. Tal sneaked in this attack and if you are not careful you can easily get checkmated. For example, should you go rook e2 or rook g2 once rook f3 materializes, it would be lights out and depending where the rook is placed, you will have a mate in two or a mate in one respectively. Scrap that. This would not be a mate but a large exaggeration. No checkmate can be triggered here but you are going to make a very easy for the opponent to crash you. Fisher at best, responded in this way, Tal in turn gets rid of this pawn from the queen side, and all Fisher manages with this rook move to c8 is to allow him to deliver this check. King c6 led to this attack on the pawn and Fisher was on his way to gaining something back. Things took a slight turn when Tal made his next move. He delivered this check, and with the king now climbing onto the fourth, Tal came up with a true gem. Can you see what he did? He used the bishop to deliver this timely check. After king b4, Tal turned the king against the rook. But right after this rook repositioning, the game was going to come to a close pretty fast. Any ideas how the magician of Riga did it? This was the move he went for and what a beauty of a response. Fischer was hopeless here and he had been in fact hopeless during the last 27 moves or so to be precise. Young Fischer opted for this response, and as soon as this pawn advanced to the brink of promotion, Fischer did the honorable thing and resigned. The idea is that whether you remove the rook or not, Fisher would not be able to survive. King a5, for example, is most likely going to lead to this rook move and with now the pawn in need to depart, as soon as you take, the mate is already in sight. If you instead take the rook, once you queen with a discovered check, the ending would be easier. King c4 leads to this check, and as soon as this king moves into d5, Nothing but this check, cause with this move we have also reached a checkmate. Bobby Fischer was an extremely talented player but Tal had been two steps ahead when Fischer decided to hit on f7 and hand over his rook. Coming back to the critical point in the game, Tal's last move was to block the check with the bishop. Rather than hit the pawn off, what if you were to come up with this queen move? If you answer with king d8, Remove this pawn and now the rook must move out of g8 and also go somewhere where is desperately needed. If you place him here, Fisher would go on to remove yet another pawn, but would he have enough to hold the game together? Queen d6 for example, or even king c7, and Fisher's attack if he has one, is going to stop here. If instead of queen d6 you opt for this move to b5, Queen g6 looks like an interesting move but falls short to rook h8. Maybe a better resolution is to try this attack on the queen, and at best this is how you can answer. Can you allow a queen check from the corner? Let's try it. Go for this move, allow the queen to come in with a check, and once you find c7, this new check might get you indeed far. King c6, 
And now this brand new attack and the alarm bell should be ringing now. Queen b6 to force off the queens and the queens would have to come off. If you instead try this takes with the rook, should you ever grab hold of the queen, if the queen also comes off, once you take on the first, this too is a checkmate and of course this would be a huge blunder. There are so many other variation or lines we could have used but to allow the queen to sneak into the corner to deliver a check would be an unforgiving error. If you allow this queen check, king c7, another check, and king c6, right after this rook attack materializes, queen b6, take and take, and Fisher, if you like can no longer lose and winning is not bound to happen either. If you ever get tempted and remove this bishop, that would be the end because once you arrest this rook, taking on e7, gets you in with a mate in two and this is allowed to happen only because of how the king is positioned, leaving him with no escape capabilities. Bobby Fisher had learned a great lesson today and believe it or not, this game we covered today had been one of his 25 favorites. And if you like to know more, this is the only game from one of the books he published featuring his only loss. So this game in particular, though lost in the end, had been registered as of Bobby Fisher's favorites, which also means what we looked at today, must have touched him in so many different ways. Later on of course, he became the player he was, but no one can go that far without making mistakes and ultimately learning from them. I sincerely hope you have enjoyed this edition and look forward to seeing you again in our next edition. God bless.